Well, good morning, Apostles family. Welcome to worship. We're glad that you're here. If you haven't already, um, we've been lighting Advent candles uh, during this season, and we're on the third week of Advent. So if you haven't already um, uh, lighted the the first two candles, go ahead and do that. And then we're going to light the third one. And this is, of course, the the candle of of joy um, as as we consider joy, um, part of the, the Advent themes of love, joy, and peace. And um, uh, we, we are considering how Jesus is, is the center of our joy. We looked at it last week in Revelation 4, where the call for Christians is to actually remove everything that keeps us from seeing Jesus because Jesus is the center of our happiness and our joy. He is uh, the place where there is pleasures forevermore. And so if you would, if you would stand, if you feel comfortable enough to stand while we worship, um, let me call you to worship with this reading. And if you could read the underlined portions with me. This is from Luke 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Let's sing together. Of his love and wonders, wonders. 
Well, would you pray with me? Lord, for many of us, this Christmas season brings with it sorrow, confusion, anxiety, and exhaustion. We see the seats left empty at the table. We feel the absence of another's warm embrace. We taste the bitterness of loneliness. This year ends with a sigh. But you know, Lord, you've bottled up the tears of all your children and we trust that they are not wasted. We know that you are for us. We know that our grief does not exclude a deep-seated joy. It makes a way for it. We pray for joy. We know that we will have trouble in this world, and yet you have overcome the world. We pray for courage. We know that you do not break the bruised reed or snuff out the smoldering wick. You heal the brokenhearted. We pray for endurance. We declare with the psalmist, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? In Jesus' wonderful and powerful name we pray, amen.
In the dawning of the King, He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Let's hear these words of Jesus. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As those who have been freed from the weight of sin, freed from striving for significance. Let's rest together in this good news and pass the peace of Christ to one another now.
The reading from God's word today is Revelation 5, 1 through 14. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying in a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that's in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I was listening this week to a talk by um, Alan Jacobs, and he, he talks about two kinds of knowledge, two ways of knowing and understanding something. The, the first is uh, the, the knowledge of assent, where I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with what you are saying intellectually. Right? I, I may say something to you in this sermon, and you respond with, well, I suppose that's true. I'm, I'm following you. I'm tracking with you with my mind. The second way is what he calls um, habitus, it's sort of the Latin word, habitus, where I'm, I'm following you not just with my mind, but with my feet. I live out this truth. It forms uh, my way of, of being. It begin, I begin to embody this truth. It shapes my impulses. I, I begin to know and learn this truth by heart. Now, Advent season which is the season that we're in. Advent is a season in the calendar of the church where we as a church community seek to not only understand and know the stories of Christmas and, and the incarnation of Christ, but we aim to, to have a kind of habitus, a kind of uh, knowing it by heart to learning it by the heart, right? It shapes our impulses, it shapes our passions, our habits, where, where, where we follow the truths with our feet, not just our minds, right? It shapes our buying habits, it shapes how we love, it shapes how we view ourselves and how we view the world and how we view others. Now, in Revelation 5, in our scene, our passages that we're looking at, John the Apostle, for at least just a moment, becomes the center of attention before it just goes back to Christ being the center of attention. But just for a brief moment, John becomes the center of attention and we see where John experiences a kind of deeper habitus of the heart. We see John experience this um, in Revelation 5. I mean, he's an old man. He is, he is a deep theologian. He's written a good portion of the New Testament. He's a disciple of Jesus. He has a kind of habitus of the heart. He's, he's the one whom Jesus calls his beloved disciple. But here, even in this scene, even John, 
you see him deepen not only his ascent to truth of what's going on, but you see him ascend to a kind of deeper habitus, a deeper heart knowledge. And the invitation of Revelation 4 to us is to find some way in our hearts and in our lives to follow him there. There's this kind of invitation, come with me and see what I'm seeing and be changed in the way that I'm being changed. Now, what's just happened in Revelation 4, what we've been looking at the past two weeks, is the scene of the throne room of Christ and everything is centered around the throne, remember? And John gets caught up in this scene of worship and, and peace. Remember the, the sea that like, that's like glass, this just peaceful moment, this peaceful scene of, of shalom, of happiness and joy. And John gets caught up in this scene. And we looked at it for two weeks and and, uh, it's a vision. Jamie said uh, it was a vision of Christ's holiness, but you don't just want to see his holiness, you want to live in it. And and John begins in Revelation 5, he sort of wakes up from this scene and becomes a little bit more aware of himself maybe. And he longs to not just enjoy this scene, but to participate in it, to live in it. And he sees the one on the throne holding in his hand a scroll, a book, and it's sealed. It's got seven sealed. It's perfectly sealed, right? Now, this scroll um, that has seven seals on it, it's It's dependent upon understanding what's going on in in Daniel 7 and Daniel 12. Um, There's a lot of imagery that comes from that passage, and I I can't unpack that here. But I'll, I'll just summarize is that it's in this scroll, in this book, is God's plan of justice, of restoration, of redemption, of how he's making everything right again, which was set in motion by Christ's death and resurrection, but it's yet to be completed. It's not fully resolved yet. It's, it's, it's still in the scroll. It's still sealed. And so the question is, how is it going to be resolved? It's still, who's going to, who's going to break its seals? Who's going to open the scrolls? Because this scroll resolves our aches, our longings for justice, for rightness, for mercy, for love. In other words, the scroll, which is imagery, right? It's, think, think of it as the mind of God, the mystery that's sealed of how everything's going to be okay. It's sealed. How do we open it? This this longing for, how does it get resolved? How, how, does, it, how does it open up and, and happen? How do we experience what we long for? And, and John, in, in the depth of this longing, he sees how, in, how important it is. He sees how urgent, and he begins to weep. He says, I began to weep loudly because no one was worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Now, these are important tears. It's worth reflecting on them just for a moment. Why is John weeping? How do we make sense of his tears? I think think it's a good question, actually, to ask of any major scene in the Bible where someone's weeping. Rachel, Isaac's wife, you know, in, in the scene of Jeremiah 31 and Matthew 2, she's weeping and refusing to be comforted. Or Jesus, he's, he's weeping over Lazarus' death. I mean, he knows he's about to, 
to raise Lazarus from the dead. Why, why is he weeping? Why doesn't he just say, hey, stop, everyone stop weeping. I'm going to make it okay. Why is he weeping? Or, or, or when he's weeping over Jerusalem later in the gospel story, he looks over Jerusalem and how he's going, the, the, the city's going to reject him and he weeps over it. Or, or maybe the story of, of Mary Magdalene in the garden of Jesus' tomb on Easter, she's, she's weeping. And here, John is weeping. Weeping is important in the Bible. Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And John will be comforted here in this scene. But we shouldn't move to comfort too. We shouldn't move to, to resolve this too quickly. Why is he weeping? Well, this scene for John is, is probing a deep heart wound. It's probing a deep heart wound, not just a heart wound for John, but for us, for all of us. Because tears, tears like this are, are the natural response to when our longings and our hopes are put into question. Tears are the natural response to when our longings and our hopes are put into question. In, in these moments, tears are sort of an act of protest. And sometimes it's, it's our only act of protest in a world where, where death seems to have the upper hand. It's, it's a groaning. Paul talks about a, a groaning in Romans 8 uh, at how the world is. Sometimes we're only able to weep and groan. We want something different. We long for something different. Jacques Ellul, he's French uh, theologian, and I have no idea whether I pronounced his name right. I've only read it, never heard the name pronounced. Um, and he gives a reflection on the book, the scroll, that, that John is weeping and longing to see unsealed and read. And he says, this book is filled with what the Father, the God, the Father, imagines us to be. It's filled with what the Father imagines us to be and, he ima and, he, and what He imagines us will to become. In other words, it's our potential, what, what we're made to be and what we're made to become. Who, who we're meant to be. John has just experienced in Revelation 4 this scene, a vision of complete happiness, of peace and worship. In other words, he sees a vision of what he and the world can become, what we're meant to be, what, what the Father imagines us to be. And he longs for it with a, with a new urgency, an urgency that longs for what the Father imagines us to be and to become what he, what he longs for that to be a reality now. He's weeping because there's an urgency that he longs for, for that scene to be a reality now. Because he's weary, he's an old man now, Remember, he's imprisoned on this island of Patmos. He's weary of, of his hopes being deferred and delayed. And so he weeps. He weeps. This week I was um, reading a piece in the New York Times. It was called The, the Children of Pornhub. I wonder if you read it. And it was doing this investigation into this huge porn site, Pornhub. And how it's the most visited website, uh, more than Amazon or YouTube, or it's like the fourth most visited website. And it's making millions, no, billions, on videos that are exploiting and trafficking young girls, adolescents. And the stories, I mean, they, they made me weep. I mean, there's, at one point I had to look away from the reading and just cry. Now in my crying, when I'm reading this and I'm crying, do I know that at some point Jesus is going to return and make everything okay? 
Do I know that? Yes, I know that. But in that moment, when I'm reading this and I'm weeping and I'm reading these stories of little girls, there is an urgency to my tears. Right? There are children suffering in this world, Jesus. There's an urgency. There's a kind of refusal of false comfort. And what John is showing us here is that there's a kind of holiness to this kind of weeping. Now, this is Advent. We're in a season of Advent. And Advent can really be seen as waiting with urgent tears. And and John here is is teaching us what we're waiting for. We're, We're waiting for someone worthy enough to open the scroll and to break its seals. And so the scene moves um, to to one of the heavenly residents, that one of the elders comes to comfort, comes to comfort weeping John with this vision of one who's worthy enough to open the scrolls and break the seals. Now, here's this important lesson. When John feels the pain of his anxiety, the pain, the urgency of his heart wound, he doesn't escape the pain, right? He doesn't check his phone. He doesn't spend the rest of the evening on Netflix. He pushes into the person of Christ. He resists escapism. He he resists numbing himself. And John is led into looking and meditating on what might be his hope amidst his tears. The the, the elder, the the one who would would comfort John, says in verse 5, It's the lion of the tribe of Judah who's worthy. The root of David has conquered so that. He's conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Now, again, this passage is full of Old Testament illusions, right? From Genesis 49, that Judah, the tribe of Judah, is full of lions and people of lions. Or from 2 Samuel about King David, the the root of King David. Um, and, And the Psalms and the Gospels where Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's strong. He's the root of David. He's king. He's powerful. And he's conquered which means he's victorious, right? What makes him worthy at this moment to open the scroll is that he's conquered. What has he conquered? He's conquered our sin. He's conquered death and evil and injustice. The resurrection of Christ has come, has come through like a sword thrust into the heart of our ultimate enemy. And this announcement of this figure, it builds this tremendous amount of expectation for what we might see when he appears. We naturally expect this powerful, resplendent, fear-inducing figure. But that's not what he sees. John says in verse 6, I saw a lamb standing as though he had been slain. What John hears is a lion. What he sees is a lamb. What he hears is strength, but what he sees is weakness. What he hears is a conqueror, but what he sees is the quintessential victim. A lamb. Now, because of this glaring contrast between the names of Victor and Lion and Root of David and a lamb who is slain, we are are forced to recognize that the major theme in the New Testament and specifically in the book of Revelation is that victory comes through weakness and sacrifice. Now, here's what's not happening. Jesus is not putting on the mask of weakness. He's not a lion putting on a mask, a lamb mask. Nor is he a God who's merely put off his divine power where he's sort of lost it in the incarnation so that he can merely become a weak sufferer. 
No, he is both. He's both the lion and the lamb. G.K. Chesterton reflects on this theme a bit. He, he says that we, we, we have to hold on to both. He's both the lamb and the lion. In his glorified, victorious state in heaven, he is the victorious lion of Judah in the form of a slain lamb. He's both. He's not a lamb-like lion or a lion-like lamb. His lion nature doesn't cancel out his lamb nature, and his lamb nature doesn't cancel out his lion nature. He is both. His wounds are a sign of his strength. What John hears from the comforted elder is a message of life, but what he sees is a figure of death. It's both. The king has passed through death as a lamb and now stands somehow beyond death, but with the, the signs of death. Christ is a figure of power and strength and victory and life. Yes, he is. He's a, he's a figure of power, strength, victory, and life, but his power, strength, victory, and life is realized in his self-giving love at the cross. His power, his life, his victory comes through absolute surrender, through giving himself over to love, in, uh, over in love to death, so that death might never consume us and our sin never condemn us. He won. <laughs> he overcame as one who surrendered in weakness to death. Now, can we reflect just for a moment on our hearts? How we're supposed to receive this. Next week, we, I want to spend one more week in Revelation 5. And I, I want to say something about how we ought to respond to seeing this lamb. There's something that we're called to. But first, I want to give some direction on how we ready our hearts to see the lamb. Marva Dawn um, she says, we are formed and shaped by a culture that teaches us that power and performance is the way to triumph. And we are not at all ready for the appearance of the one who's seen as a lamb slain. We are not at all ready because we're formed and shaped by a culture who says the power and performance is the way. And so we're not at all ready to see the lamb who's slain. We wouldn't recognize him. Now, I wonder if we can just give some self-reflection here for a moment. I wonder if that can, could explain a good bit of us, that, that we aren't ready. That we can intellectually agree, yes, I suppose that's true, that Jesus is the lamb who is slain. I, po I suppose that's right. But is our heart ready to see him? Is our heart ready to receive Him, to, to be changed by Him? Not just an ascent knowledge, but a habitus knowledge, right? Where we don't just follow the logic of the argument of who Jesus is, but we follow it with our feet. Last week, we, we, we talked about putting ourselves in the way of His beauty, under His authority, that we're removing everything that keeps us away from Him. We're removing everything in our life that does that. And, and we're forming habits that put Him at the center. Not anything else, not ourself, not the world, but Him at the center. And, and maybe this is the time for you. Maybe this is the time where, where for many of us, we move past some superficial elements of our faith and we begin to experience Him more deeply and more fully and more rich life with Him because we, we're moving past the superficial elements of our faith and we're pressing in to a habitus of the heart where, where we experience the cost of following Him. It's not easy. Jesus calls it a cross. 
because we experience the cost of following him. We, we put off things that we might enjoy. We, we say no to things in order to experience the joy of Christ. We, we, we say no. We, there, there are doors that close so that we can experience the fullness of joy in Him. We, we say no to smaller pleasures so that we can experience pleasures forevermore in Him. That's why we do it. In other words, there is a, a, a danger maybe going on in some of us where we are pursuing a life of performance, self-fulfillment, and indulgence. Because that's how... Our culture has shaped us. A lot of the times, we're, we're not choosing those avenues. That's just how we subconsciously have been formed. And we're walking in that way. Right? We, we, we are pursuing a life of performance, self-fulfillment, and indulgence. And we just assume that we would recognize Christ without changing anything in our hearts. We just assume without changing anything in our hearts that we would see Christ, we would recognize Christ, the one whose life and death signifies values that are in exact opposition to a life of performance, self-fulfillment, and indulgence. Maybe, just maybe, Marva Dawn is right. That we are not ready for the appearance of the Lamb who is slain. Now, I'm, I'm laboring. I, 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 I'm recognizing some things in my own hearts that would keep me from seeing. And I want to labor together as a church so that we might be a church ready to see Him. I want our community to be able to partner with, with the Apostle John here, who's meditating on the vision of the Lamb who is slain and being changed by it. Not just someone who's able to assent to the knowledge of who Jesus is, but he's, he's moving into a deeper habitus of the heart. And there's this invitation in Revelation 5. Are you ready? Move into this knowledge. Move into this life. Move into this habitus. I'm praying for that. I'm praying for that. I, I talked about in our video this week, if you saw it, that it, it, it might be a good season to reintroduce this sort of fruitful, dormant, fruitful dormancy imagery that we talked about earlier last year, or earlier this year in the spring. This fruitful dormancy of even in, in the season of quiet and we're not as public as we normally are, we're more hidden, that we're readying, readying our hearts to be able to see the Lamb who is slain and to be changed by it, to be, to be different, to be transformed. I'm praying for that. Let's pray for it. Father, um, I ask for help as we are seeking and desiring change, longing for change pressing to see Jesus clearly. I know our community, we, we want, I know for many of us, we, we want to see Jesus clearly and to be changed and to experience renewal. I know that, Father. But there are so many things we're formed and shaped by in our culture that just sort of resists it. So would you help us? Would you, by your Spirit, begin to lead us to be changed and to see Jesus, to see the face of Jesus and to become like Him as we see Him. We ask for help. We ask for mercy. And it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. All right, friends, let's sing.
Let's hear and read these words together from Philippians 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. 
Friends, as we continue to sing and as we worship through giving, let's glorify our King, the Lamb who was slain, who is seated on the throne, ruling and reigning now and forever. together. Um, Father, we ask for help as we move toward the Lord's Supper in a few moments, that you would help form us to be a people ready to see the Lamb who is slain, that we are able to partner. We have a heart readiness, ready to partner with the Apostle John in seeing Jesus the Lamb who is slain, and to be changed by it, to be transformed, to be renewed. So I pray you would help us as we, as we go to the Lord's Supper and we, we see something, these signs, this body and blood, this bread and cup that help us visualize, to taste and see your death. Help us to be changed by it. We need it. And it's the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to transition to the Lord's Supper together in just a moment. But before we go, I just want to remind you and encourage you towards uh, year-end giving. We didn't create some goal uh, to aim for, to, to accomplish as a community, but rather we wanted to press into a season of, of formation where we give some assessment of where our heart is. We provided 
a, uh, a guide. It should be there in the, in the link in the chat. Um, it's a guide just to go through as a church community to ask some questions about where we've been this year, where have we set our hearts, some questions as it relates to our financial life, which is gives some exposure of where our heart is as a Christian. Um, but ultimately, just to give some encouragement towards um, how we are thinking about giving in 2021. So if you've never given, but you call this church your home, we just want to encourage you. What does it mean? What does it look like for you to make some assessment of your heart and your life and, and think about giving more consistently? How can that be a a habit of formation in you, not just a, something of an accomplishment, a spiritual accomplishment, but a means of formation. Or maybe you've been giving just sporadically, or maybe it's been a long time since you've given. Maybe in fear, um, you haven't given because you're, you're wondering what might be ahead. You're, you're trusting in your, your own safety, your own schemes of keeping your, your money safe rather than trusting in the Lord. What does it mean, not just as a spiritual accomplishment, but as a, a habit of formation that you begin to give consistently? Or maybe you begin to give again. Or maybe you already give generously and just want to encourage you, thank you, keep going. What, what does it mean to m maybe start giving to a, a mission organizations or, or one of the organizations that we partner with in Hope for New York or to create some sort of benevolence fund in your own bank account so that you can impulsively be generous um, to our community members who need help? Um, what does it mean to step into habits of formation in that way as a community? But all, all that to say, just some encouragement towards generosity this year, um, not only for your own formation, but for the financial health of our church. You're, you're doing great this year. Thank you for caring for our church and keeping us healthy in that way. Um, it's been a huge encouragement to us, uh, especially in this season of, of questions. Um, okay, friends, well, let's transition now to the Lord's Supper together.